Hey guys. So today I wanted to talk about tropes and kind of explain what I even mean by that. Um, and then kind of talk about the tropes that held me hostage for a really long time. And then from that kind of pose a question to you in response to this idea that I'm gonna present to you to consider. So what is a trope? A trope is related to stories. It's essentially what I would say is the summarization of a character on a type of character based on the characteristics that that character has in a story. So a knight in shining armor would be a trope. Damsel in distress is a trope. Um, evil stepmother I'm sure is a trope. There's all these different like tropes within stories and the one reason why I'm talking about this is because we are constantly absorbing stories all around us, narratives, ways of thinking all the time. I've talked about this on my channel before. I've talked about it in lots of different videos. Making yourself aware of the stories and the storytellers around you. And there are lots of different versions of stories and storytellers. There are storytellers in movies. There are storytellers in advertisements. And I really pose the idea to you as well that there are storytellers and and stories and narratives being constantly offered to us within relationships with people as well some people offer stories and narratives about ourselves or the relationship or the world around us in ways that are harmless or fun or even beneficial they offer narratives about ourselves that we hadn't considered before they offer narratives about the relationship, how to approach relationships, or even the world in ways that we hadn't considered before. And so storytelling and alternative offering people our alternative narratives can be really empowering. It can be really healing. I almost would say that one of the things I do on my channel is offer people alternative narratives to consider and live inside of. I think narratives and stories are almost these sorts of magical bubbles that we can hop between in our mind and the way that you are choosing to perceive your life and the people around you is a version of a story that you tell yourself every single day. So stories are always going on around us. Narrators are always around us. People offering themselves to be a narrator in our lives is always something that's kind of happening, whether they realize it or not. Again, I've used this analogy in another video, but even in advertisements, the advertiser is asking for you to trust them, trust their perspective on a product that they're trying to sell. And in that moment in time, they are almost a narrator in your life offering a story. So if stories and storytellers and narrators are constantly around you and these things are sort of being offered to you, whether consciously, unconsciously, whatever, intentionally or unintentionally, tropes are also being offered to you because tropes exist within stories. So if characters, you're, all, you're constantly witnessing characters that might be appealing to you to imitate, that might be desirous to you for you to experience, but tropes are always around you if stories are always around you too. And so there are tropes that appeal to men, there are male tropes that appeal to men, there are female tropes that appeal to women. Um, and I would almost, suggest and pose to you especially if you're a girl listening to this right now because I am a girl and so I can only really talk from the female perspective in this video but for female tropes specifically you know I think different tropes appeal to different girls for different reasons it's almost like asking a girl what her favorite Disney princess is every girl is going to probably say a different Disney princess and that's because different characteristics appeal to each of us individually as women for what we consider to be a strong woman a sexy woman a cool girl whatever that is and so there are different tropes that appeal to women and girls and there are therefore also different tropes that I think can that can hold us hostage because the cool girl held me hostage for a really long time and I'm gonna explain what the cool girl is in just a second but there are some of my friends that are immune to the cool girl they have not fallen for that idea that idea does not appeal to them in any kind of way and I do call it being immune um, so I was held hostage by a trope a character trope and a, a trope idea that my other friends were not held hostage by but they do have tropes that do appeal to them and that could potentially hold them hostage as well. And I say held hostage because what I mean by that is if you, if you experience a trope that 
does not encourage healthy lifestyles for you, that you are more so attempting to imitate but is not like you at all, and that causes feelings of self-rejection, um, feelings of, self, of failure within yourself because you're trying to be something that you innately aren't. You know, that's where it gets unhealthy and almost becomes a form of, I don't know if addiction is too strong of a word, but it just becomes something that you're constantly trying to pursue, but almost to your own detriment. And then you are in a way almost held hostage by that trope and by that idea. And, and stories can hold you hostage as well in that way too. So for me, the cool girl trope held me hostage specifically the most. And what is the cool girl trope? I'm gonna read you the actual definition of something that I found on the internet that's actually very interesting and <laughs> mildly insulted me. And then I also talk about what my own definition of the cool girl looks like, although I also found a definition of that within another article. And I'm just like, it's no idea, just my idea. Like, am I not freaking original in anything anymore? Is everything just like borrowed knowledge? So anyway, the cool girl in this definition is the personification of the male fantasy. So what it's basically saying is you might think that this is your idea, but it's actually just what men want from women, uh, not necessarily even what women want for themselves. So she's basically the personification of the ultimate male fantasy. She looks and acts exactly how a man wants her to, and thus is impossible to personify an actual reality. Despite this, many young women strive to masquerade as this persona in order to fit in with the girls they see in the media. So, ouch, <laughs> thank you for that, internet people. Uh, but when you search cool girl trope, you can actually find like several freaking articles on this, which was mind blowing to me because I just learned this word this year. There's actually an article uh, by Strike Magazines. The title is The Cool Girl Trope, Why It's Ruining Our Reality. Great. And then the one where I actually sort of found the definition that matched pretty much exactly how I had been trying to act for the majority of my life is an, art, uh, an article by hercampus.com called The Origin of the Cool Girl Trope. And basically it's hot, she's good with cars, she's one of the boys, but still uh, resides within the male gaze. She never really wears makeup that much, yet her skin is naturally perfect. Goes on to say the cool girl trope is a girl who looks gorgeous while doing traditionally masculine activities like fixing cars, riding skateboards. And then, <laughs> the sentence that was especially painful, I didn't write this, okay? I'm just reading it, guys, all right? And I, I feel just as hurt <laughs> as anyone else reading this. Uh, but the cool girl allows herself to act as a doormat to men and never truly develops her own personality. Her entire character is created by the expectation of never speaking up for her own thoughts, beliefs, and being to go with the flow that the man finds attractive. Um, the men therefore will realize that she's not like the other girls because other girls cause drama, but this girl doesn't mind a single thing about anything. And that is so freaking true that it, I mean, in other videos, I've even talked about this, how I worked so hard on not having any needs because I didn't want to be seen as dramatic. And then I learned later that that's really just a tool that was basically used to manipulate me so that they could do whatever they wanted and I would never complain about anything. Guys invented the spark so they could not call and treat you kind of badly and keep you guessing and then convince you that that anxiety and that fear that just develops naturally in you is actually just a spark. Which is a really horrible reality to live in. It's like, yeah, you can fuck me and never call me. I'll be fine. I don't have needs because I'm so cool. Even though I was like crying in bed and like checking my phone every two seconds, but no, I was fine. You know what I mean? It's that denial of true self. Like if there are people who out there who can actually have casual sex, congratulations, more power to you. But if you're like me, and it was actually causing you to feel mildly insane most of the time, might not be a lifestyle for you. And that doesn't make you weak. You're not weak for wanting love. But please stop torturing yourself by trying to be basically this because it is the male fantasy. And I don't desire to be the male fantasy today. I desire to be myself. So, so where could I have gotten this idea? You know, where could I have possibly formed this idea was it on my own i pose to you no good sir it was not and i'm gonna list off some of the movies that like i wasn't even really allowed to watch movies mainstream movies for most of my life but then when i finally was kind of allowed to later in my life and then once i finally also got out into the world it was watching like binge watching rom-coms and stuff you know these are some of the movies that 
posed different aspects of this trope to me that I was just absorbing like it was freaking oxygen or water or something. Anyway, you know, like movies like 10 Things About, 10 Things I Hate About You. In 10 Things I Hate About You, she definitely was a type of a cool girl to me. And none of these qualities are explicitly negative sometimes. There are people who are this way and that is genuinely who they are. What I'm getting at in this video though is, is the, I didn't know who to be. I had no framework for how to be a woman. And so I observed all these different stories through movies, absorbed them and just tried imitating them in, in lots of different forms and facets because I thought that's what I, what I needed to be in order to attain a guy. And so in 10 Things I Hate About You, you know, she's this very like angry, independent girl who like doesn't want a relationship and men can fuck off and all this stuff. And he in turn is also his own version of like kind of a cool, aloof boy. I mean, they don't show girls pining after him, but he's physically attractive and he also is not necessarily like very attainable himself. So they're both kind of like unattainable and cool and aloof. So it created this kind of assumption in me that I could change cool and aloof guys and I needed to be this type of girl. And it wasn't just this movie, I'm about to explain others, but these are the types of movies that created this idea in me that I needed to be a cool and aloof girl in order to get a cool and aloof guy. Pride and Prejudice, you know, she's, she's fighting the social norms in this movie. She, she's trapped by society's rules and she wants to be different from all the other girls. Because of that, he hates most women and she ended up changing him. And he sees her and her differentness from society. So that element was kind of there. Titanic, she's also trapped by society's rules. Constantly, these females are trapped by society's rules. They don't wanna be like all the other girls. They wanna break away from the norm and be different. And that my entire life, it was that. It was like, oh, I need to be different or no one's gonna be attracted to me. If I'm following and acting like all the other girls out there, no one's gonna like me. I have to be like the opposite of everything around me all the time. It was freaking exhausting. Some of these I might be dating myself a little bit and showing how old I am. If you're a younger person here and I'm listing off these movies and you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, that's your problem, not mine. Stop being so young. So anyway, a lot like love, you know, it's this character where she's basically fine with casual sex. Again, she's not super overly emotionally committed to anything. She's the one who just doesn't really want like expectations put on her that much. Uh, they keep randomly running into each other. She's wild, she's funny, she's bothered by, um, she's not bothered by the deeply, I can't even read my own freaking notes, man. She's not deeply bothered by the random run-ins and the random sort of like casual emotional experiences that they're having. Like they can have these deep emotional experiences and then they can like, not meet up for a while and she's fine with it. It doesn't like break her in two. And then it would break me in two in real life. And I look at women like this from movies and I'd think what is wrong with me, you know? Because the character in the movie could do it. The movie that only lasted for an hour and a half and wasn't actually a real relationship and never showed what happened with the relationship long-term afterwards, but she could do it and I couldn't. So I must be a failure or whatever. Also random one that's not on my list that just popped into my head is Underworld. <laughs> Have anyone seen that movie? Like, I feel like that is the ultimate cool girl trope. Like, for me, because she's, she's hot, she's like fighting people, you know, like she's aloof, nobody can get to her heart. I mean, she's angry, she's kind of violent, she can protect herself, all that stuff, you know what I mean? Um, and so in a way, she has these masculine qualities because I think a lot of masculine qualities are men being protective of women. So it's a woman being protective of herself. She's almost being the man for herself and to herself. And when you actually think about that, that really kind of doesn't work in relationships because relationships are about depending on each other, interdependency, not codependency, careful to not confuse those two, but interdependency, which is incredibly vulnerable, where you are actually depending on each other in healthy ways and it's mutual and equal. And, and if you're being the man for yourself and to yourself, which a lot of times you have to do when you're single, but relinquishing that role to a man when you're finally dating a man, is really important. You come along and you'd like to contribute something to the relationship, but they're already kind of doing everything for themselves. You know, there, there's a part where you have to relinquish, w relinquish that stuff. But yeah, a lot of these movies almost encourage this idea of like, you can be the man for yourself and to yourself. And then men are going to find that hot and, 
and that's good they like want that but actually men who want that men who want you to be the man for yourself and to you that yourself probably want that because they don't care about you very much because any man that I've ever met who genuinely wants to be in my life and dating me wants me to relinquish that role so that they can feel some kind of worth and some kind of contribution to my life so if a man is totally fine with me staying in that role and he's not trying to fill it at all that's probably a red flag uh, another one on this list is save the last dance i don't know if you've seen this but she's basically depressed her mom died she has to like move to a brand new location and live and move in with her dad who she's not super close to and um she you know she's kind of this cool girl she knows how to dance and stuff and then there's a boy who sees her in, in whatever kind of way this whole idea of people like seeing you right like you don't know anything about them they don't know anything about you but they see you um, when I say see you I guess it means this this idea of somebody like knowing everything about you almost on this like intuitive hot level right away right that's actually not how relationships work and this would get me in a lot of trouble because a lot of narcissists and predatory people do this whole like I see you thing. Um, it's almost like an, a, a way of mind reading where they act like they know everything about you without knowing you at all because it takes time to know people. I don't care how many facts you've listed off to each other on the phone. The way that you truly know someone is through their actions, not their words. They show you who they are and they show you who they are in difficult moments and moments when it's not easy in moments when the honeymoon stage has worn off. That's how you truly know someone and that takes time. It takes time for them to show you what they're like in the difficult moments and for you to have an accumulation of examples of what their behavior is like in lots of varied and different scenarios. So I don't care if you've talked on the phone for 15 hours in the, you know, a matter of two days, you still don't know that person. Sorry. So this whole uh, they see you thing that happens in movies is like a very common theme and it really would get me in dangerous situations a lot when I was younger because I would fall for that. I would fall for this idea of a stranger because I saw it in movies. If a stranger approached me and was basically like, I sense all this stuff about you. I know all this stuff about you. Like I wanted that kind of mind reading to be happening because I thought that's how love was shown by someone and that's how chemistry was proven and connection was proven and if the seeing thing wasn't happening if they weren't seeing me in the middle of the room and I wasn't so different to them from literally everyone else in the sort of like innate you know physical attraction chemical attraction type deal then we must not be for each other and that was very much perpetuated by movies uh, lots of different rom-coms lots of different dramas and it's actually like I said not how it works and actually kind of a red flag now if somebody does that to me if somebody acts like they know a bunch of stuff about me when they've just met me met me I'm gonna be like a <laughs> try again and B, what are you what kind of narrative are you trying to push on me right now where you're acting like you know me better than I know myself as a total stranger who hasn't earned my trust yet how to deal is another one that I'm not sure if a lot of people have seen um, it's with Mandy Moore but she's angry about her parents divorce she doesn't believe in love anymore you know there's this guy who's like attracted to her and he's definitely like kind of a player and she pushes him away and she won't let him in and and so that's another common thing with the cool girl trope is this idea of like you know being angry and closed off and and they're just pushing and and they love a challenge so they wait around and then if you're just like that enough they'll just be so turned on by how emotionally broken and shut down you are that they'll push through that and get over that wall and and really, again, when we're talking about like kind of more predatory people, they love a challenge. They love a challenge. The more boundaries you have, I feel like the more aroused they are. And I would notice in a lot of these relationships when they're stopped being a chase, with, which involves an adrenaline rush, a sense of accomplishment. Once I was finally caught, basically, which is what these movies never show, right? It's like you get to the end of the rom-com, or the drama or whatever the girls finally caught caught or the relationship works out and they're together there's a culmination and the chase ends and that's the end of the movie okay well guess what in real life with a lot of these people who were more predatory or just in it for for the adrenaline and the chase once they got me they didn't really want me anymore 
because they already got me. So it, like that's the part the movies don't show. And I know I'm probably ruining like a, a lot of movies for you maybe. I hope I freaking am. Only in the sense that you start watching these things with new eyes. Like I still enjoy watching this stuff, but I don't get sucked into the character in the same way that I used to, where I would almost like absorb it like a Bible that I was trying to study to learn how to approach this stuff in real life. Please don't do that. Please enjoy them for what they are, which is pure fiction in almost every sense of that phrase, but also be able to see them and see the narrative that's being presented to you and remember that you have a choice. You have a choice whether to accept this story as a possible reality that could happen for you too, or just to enjoy it as almost a fairy tale of sorts, something that is so beyond the realm of actual reality and the rules of reality and how reality works, being so beyond that that it never could happen in real life, but wow, what a fun story to watch. A lot of times what comes with the cool girl trope in these stories is the cool boy trope. And the cool boy trope is usually a man who cannot normally be tied down, um, is equally wild and free, and oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes almost like lurking in the shadows, kind of. And her inner strength impresses this man and ultimately makes him desire her. She almost outmans him in whatever kind of way, like she is more of a man than him. Her aloofness and lack of availability ties down the cool boy who normally could not be tied down by anyone else. And I think Twilight is a different kind of example of that. Granted, he was like a vampire and she was special for different reasons, but either way, he was like very much aloof. There's lots of different cool boy tropes that come with cool girl tropes in a lot of the stories that I mentioned. And so that's also where I think the, the very like kind man that exists out there stopped being appreciated because girls started desiring to be the cool girl trope in order to attain the cool boy trope. And the whole reality of us just being ourselves and being kind to one another and these sorts of games not necessarily being being involved in this kind of way this kind of like love bombing approach that many psychopaths have all this different stuff sort of got normalized through lots of different stories but that is all i wanted to kind of explain about the cool girl and then my last point beyond the cool girl trope and tropes in general now that i think hopefully you understand them a little bit is kind of to tie this all back to something that I really see happening today. I think an idea that was sort of introduced through things like the cool girl trope, I think that was where maybe the emergence of it almost maybe started. The cool girl trope from my generation, I see it almost kind of like changing and morphing into what I would almost call the psychopathic woman trope. And what I mean by that is that, just like I described, described the characteristics of the cool girl, what I see women aiming for now as an unrealistic standard for themselves because the cool girl trope was an unrealistic standard. And there's another trope called the manic pixie girl that you can Google and that also is a very unrealistic standard for women. You can't be that way all the time. There are lots of rom-coms that I could go into just exploring the manic pixie girl trope, but I feel like just even by describing her, you can probably think of lots of movie where, movies where this exists. But she's basically someone who, you know, you have the the very sheltered, withdrawn man and the manic pixie girl trope is basically someone who brings new meaning to this man's life. She's hyper, she's eccentric, she's energetic, she's quirky, and she's different from society in that way, but she has a lot of idiosyncrasies. She has a childlike playfulness and she's crazy in her own way and extremely lifelike, but again, has almost sort of broken away from society's norms in a different way that's playful and fun. Um, not necessarily like dark and broody, but more so eccentric and fun. And she helps this, this main male character almost come back to life from her eccentricness. She encourages him to have like new ways of thinking that are playful, new ways of behaving that are playful, you know? So that, that's another like female trope that I could see people being tempted to imitate. And I probably at some point was also trying to imitate when I was a young teenager as well. Um, but with, so with the psychopathic woman trope, um, what I see is we've moved from the cool girl into a type of woman. It's evolved and changed into a type of woman that is equally 
removed from society, unrealistic, unattainable. And I mean, unless you actually have this personality disorder going on, imitating it is a futile effort because you actually do have emotional needs and that's okay. <laughs> and to try to pretend to be like these people, like a psychopathic woman is impossible because you actually feel feelings and that will handicap you and, and you can't keep up and it's okay that you can't keep up. Um, but I do see people almost trying to imitate psychopathic women and when they're not one. And, and this is where I'm trying to make this video as kind of a call to arms to bring people back to reality, to say, look, it's okay to have emotional needs. And this does not need to be the end goal. Having a personality disorder or imitating a personality disorder does not need to be the end goal. And so I'm sure you already know where I'm going with this, but in case you don't, I'm just gonna list out some of the qualities of a psychopath and then sort of compare that to the standards I see women feeling like they're holding themselves to within sexual relationships or attempts at dating. And, and I'm, I know most people probably don't even realize that they're doing this, but I do kind of feel like this is what's, what's happening. So, you know, with a lot of factor one psychopaths, primary psychopathy, you have callousness, a lack of emotionality, I would say. There's also a uh, boldness and impulsivity that occurs a lot of times. And then the other thing that I see that, the, the main thing that I see is also this desire for power in, really when people are going on dates now and i fall in, into this habit as well you know i feel like society in general is obsessed with like power and who has the power and getting the power for yourself and it's all about inner power right and that word power over and over and over again i am a christian and so that does come into play in the things that i believe but i personally feel like the, the thing to be aware of is that a if power is ultimately your end goal that can cause you to do a lot of crazy stuff just to feel like you're on top the entire time. And sometimes being on top and winning is not always the ultimate goal because there are people out there, really evil people out there, who you cannot always win against. Sometimes you have to walk away and let them win in the short-term sense so that you can win in the long-term sense. And winning long-term is not letting them make you bite at the bit and be stuck to them emotionally and on that sort of puppeteering string doing that tap dance that they want you to do, you know, giving all your energy to them in that sense. Sometimes you have to let them win short term so that you can win long term by keeping your sanity. The one most like important thing that I forgot to include in this description of a psychopathic person that is like overtaking our society is most people who are, my phone cut out on this part and I have like no freaking idea why, but what I was saying is that people who struggle with attachment disorders like psychopathy struggle with valuing and caring about long-term relationships and emotional attachments in the same way that we sometimes have the ability to care about them and desire them. So that is one thing that I do see becoming more and more normalized in society today is a lack of value and a lack of importance placed upon this. And a lot of people trying to imitate this quality and act like that's how they feel inside too, but actually it's not. And so when you're in a society where like, this is the growing norm, like a lack of commitment and a lack of a long-term monogamous relationship, when that's becoming the norm and everybody's imitating that or pursuing that, it does start to make you feel abnormal when you're someone who actually wants a long-term relationship, a monogamous long-term relationship, uh, with these expectations of like being faithful and staying committed. So there is almost a pressure to imitate that and act like that's a thing or can try and convince yourself that you want that too because nobody else wants it and it is very lonely to not want the same thing as everybody else around you, to want something different that feels more rare. But that is where I see a lot of girls also being like, I'm fine, I don't wanna date anybody, I'll just like sleep around. And I'm like, really? And after talking to them for a while, that they do admit, you know, that they do actually want a relationship, but they're afraid to ask for one and they don't want to get hurt. They don't want to get hurt by expecting or wanting that for themselves and then being shamed for that. So I'm also, this I really think is more the important emphasis that I want to place aside from all the other qualities on what I'm trying to get at is, you know, you don't have to want the same things as a psychopath. Maybe you don't want it currently in your life right now and I respect that. It's not like you have to want 
a long-term relationship or something's wrong with you. I'm not saying that either, but I'm just saying most people do desire someone to be with long-term who is theirs, who is their partner that they can grow closer with in deep intimacy long-term and develop and grow a life together. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that. You're not crazy for wanting that. You're not weak for wanting that. There's just a lot of people out there who are who are struggling with these types of personality disorders who are trying to convince you that you should want the same thing as them. And that's not necessarily true and that's okay. And if the cool girl trope emerged from a male fantasy, I don't think it's so crazy to say that the psychopathic woman trope is also something that is emerging from a new generation of men who are addicted to porn, have fantasies that are even more removed from reality than they used to be. And this is one of them. And I also just want to encourage you when you feel like maybe they're this like, because I, I hear people talk about them sometimes like this, where it's like with psychopaths, there's, there's no crack in their armor, almost. There is, you know, the suicide rate with people who are psychopaths, there, there is an actual suicide rate. And there's also a death rate for people who die young because the impulsiveness is that high and the need for stimulation is so intense that when they're not constantly stimulated, they, they struggle with that. And the depression that they feel is very intense. I don't even know if depression is the right word, but it's the emptiness, the emptiness that they feel from the lack of stimulation really really affects them and there are psychopaths that do kill themselves and there are also psychopaths who die young because it's like ridiculous the lack of self-control that they have those are the ones that oftentimes also end up in prison and stuff and so it's not that they don't have any crack in their armor you know I think on the outside when you're lose when it feels like you're losing to a person like this it feels like they have no crack in their armor but long term it's not a sustainable thing it's just not and, and to try and imitate them means that you're eventually going to also experience some of the misery that they do as well. The only difference is that you actually have feelings and you will feel the misery in a different way that they don't. So if you really wanna imitate a person like this, just know that you're also gonna experience the repercussions of the actions just like they do. But the only difference is that they're not gonna feel it and you are. So at least allow yourself to act like a person with feelings and with emotions so that the repercussions that you experience are also the equivalent of where you're at in the field that you're playing on. I just find it interesting because we live in a world today where we openly criticize people with psychopathy and with narcissism. We bash on these people, we ostracize them, we hate on them, we push them away. We are more than happy to discuss all of the ways that they hurt us. But then in the dating realm, I do see more and more people, whether they realize it or not, attempting to imitate what seems like to me psychopathic qualities and narcissistic qualities. And maybe imitate isn't a fair word. Maybe it's because more and more people are struggling with cluster B personality disorders. I don't know, but I'm meeting a lot of girls who actually do have needs and do have feelings and they're trying to pretend that it's the opposite. And I don't wanna live in a reality like that. I'd rather stay where I'm at and try to figure out what to be grateful with the things that I have and approach dating in a way where I'm true to myself. And I am not the cool girl trope today, but more than anything, I get to create my own tropes and my own versions of myself that I want to be. And I am not ashamed of having needs. I am not ashamed of the fact that I am not psychopathic. I'm not ashamed of the fact that manipulative people probably can outthink me, probably would get one over on me. But you know what, at the end of the day, I can sleep at night because I know that I am genuinely striving to be an honest, open, loving person and I'm looking for someone mutually like that as well. I'm not trying to attract other psychopaths by acting like a psychopath. I'm okay today. And so I really hope that this video has been helpful for you to really examine once again, the storytellers around you, the tropes that you're absorbing, the tropes that you're taking serious, and really asking yourself, what type of woman do I want to be in my own way? How do I want to define a strong woman? How do I want to define a unique woman for myself? Really, what do I want to be? What do I want to embrace about myself that I already am? How, who am I? And of the qualities of who I am and how I already act, what do I want to genuinely love and be excited about and grow to be even better at on a deeper level? 
take a look inside and see what's already there that doesn't need any changing at all, but already is a flower that just needs some love and some water and some appreciation and some sunlight to be seen by others. So thank you again for watching my video. I hope it was helpful and God bless.